Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Josh and I will be, um, as Teresa said, going through a brief history of the rowing on the Hudson. I'm going to cover the, uh, the older history, and Josh will bring us up to the present, talk about uh, what's going on in the rowing community today. Uh, let me share my screen. And let's no, wait a second. Hold on. To the top here. <coughs> Okay, can everybody see that? Title page? Looks okay. good. Yes, it's good, Bill. Okay, good. So, um, I'm Bill Davies and Josh will uh, follow up with uh, uh, toward the end of the uh, presentation. I want to timeline, uh, just to get a, a <clears throat> scope of the history of rowing on the Hudson River. It uh, goes all the way back to the 18th century, 1700s. Um, there was a, a uh, all the way up into the 1800s, both professional and amateur rowers competing. In the mid 1800s, became much more popular in more and more rowing uh, organized clubs. Um, and that's when Poughkeepsie and Newburgh became uh, more prominent um, centers for rowing. And uh, 1895 was a key date. That's when the Intercollegiate Rowing Association uh, began racing in Poughkeepsie, and that continued until 1949. Um, and that uh, was a, a very big um, event, annual event in Poughkeepsie. And we'll spend a little, little bit of time talking about that. Um, and then uh, in 1949, that's when local high school rowing began. And then uh, the colleges uh, start up crews in the uh, 1960 through the 83. Um, and then um, 1990 to today, high school rowing grew and, and more community rowing. So that's kind of the scope of what we're gonna talk about. Uh, I wanna talk about rowing as a sport. Uh, it started with um, common rowboats. They were used as a, as a um, common means of transportation on the water, uh, ferrying people and small cargo. And so competition naturally arose, uh, particularly professionals wanted to demonstrate their, uh, their speed and prowess on the water. They would compete and uh, wagering was, was quite popular on these, uh, these races. Um, <clears throat> competition began in the US in the, in the 1700s, but it went back to the 1600s at least in, in Britain. Uh, where rowing, was all, uh, rowing races were also very popular. And by 1872, just so you get a sense, uh, uh, there were 150 regattas held uh, that year in the United States. So it was uh, very, very popular. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in 1824, there was a very big race that was held in, in New York. It was um, <clears throat> set up by a captain from a British ship that had sailed over from uh, England and brought a uh, boat they call it was called the Dart, which was a um, very successful racing boat from London that uh, he brought four oarsmen over with him just for the purposes of racing. And he put up a thousand dollar. And today that would be equivalent to about $23,000. So this was a, a very sizable prize. And he challenged uh, and the Americans that wanted to, uh, to race against them. So uh, New York put up a boat, uh, the American Star with four oarsmen in it. And uh, they raced from the Battery, the south end of, of Manhattan, up to Hoboken and back. So it was about a six mile race. And uh, the American Star won by about 400 yards. So it was a uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty clear win for the Americans. And uh, the picture here is a replica of the boat the American crew re uh, ra raced in, um, it's called the General Lafayette. It was a, a reproduction, uh, which is at Mystic Seaport. It's, you can't see it, unfortunately, it's in storage, but this gives you a sense of what the boat looked like. Um, and they were, they were very immensely popular. They said uh, up to 50,000 people watching this race along the shores. 
In the 19th century, four or uh, shell racing was, was quite popular. <clears throat> there were a number of local um, oarsmen that uh, competed and were quite successful. There were the Ward brothers of Cornwall. Um, there were five of uh, nine that competed at various times together. The Bigland brothers who um, uh, grew up in Newburgh and later moved to uh, New York City. Um, large family of six brothers and four of them raced uh, successfully. Um, and there was a group, uh, not a group, but of uh, men um, in Poughkeepsie called the Young Strangers. Uh, we've got to talk about a famous race they were in. Uh, the Ward brothers uh, grew up on fishing vessels. Their father was a fisherman, had a number of, uh, of ships he used for, for fishing. So they spent their, their life on the water and uh, they uh, were quite successful. Uh, they beat the, the big ones um, in a famous race. And there was a big race up, held in 1871, which uh, brought crews from Europe. And they raced on uh, up in Saratoga on the lake there. And uh, the Ward brothers beat everyone. So they were crowned the uh, world champions um, back in 1871. Um, here's a picture uh, 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 done by Thomas Eakins. He was a famous painter uh, back in the 1800s. And uh, this is a painting from the National Gallery. It's, it's of two of the um, brothers, Bigland brothers, rowing a, in a pair. Um, they, the Bigland brothers rowed singles and, and pairs and, and fours as well. So they uh, rowed many, many types of boats. Thomas Eakins painted a total of uh, 11 pictures. Um, he, he loved to um, paint athletes, and the big ones were quite uh, well known at the time, uh, would be comparable to um, you know, famous baseball players or basketball players that people know today. Um, the Ward brothers, the big ones, uh, were well known at that time in, in that manner. Um, there was a, a big race between the Biglands and the Young Strangers in 1865, and this is a, a print of the uh, of the event. Um, cur appeared in, in one of the papers. Uh, this is from the Adrian's Library, and uh, the race occurred in in Poughkeepsie, and um, it was such a great story. The Collier's Magazine. Uh, recreated the, uh, the story and, and illustrated it in their magazine in uh, eight, 1947, so 80 years later. Um, and so we used this to, to illustrate the, the story. But there were, um, again, very, very popular races. Back in uh, at that time, the, uh, there were reported to be 20,000 spectators uh, who came to Poughkeepsie to watch this race. Um, and there were many um, as they say, fancy men and, and women all dressed up. The dance halls were, were uh, filled to capacity. So it was extremely popular. And uh, the race itself uh, started probably off of Warriors Park and went north two and a half miles um, around a stake boat and returned. Um, and the start was uh, signaled by a cannon on top of Kale Rock. Uh, so you can see the rock and you can see the Hudson River here, Rogers Point in the distance. Um, in addition to the 20,000 spectators, it was estimated that half, roughly half of them were, were betting on this, this event. So there was a lot of money riding on the results. And as a result of that, uh, people got uh, quite excited because there was a, a um, the Bigland brothers, as they were racing down the course, uh, reported to impede the uh, young stranger's boat. So they, they crossed over into their lane and the young strangers filed a protest. Um, a huge crowd gathered around the Poughkeepsie Hotel where the referees were um, reviewing the protest and trying to make a decision. And there was uh, a mob with, uh, with guns and, and shouting, potentially burn down the hotel. Um, but in spite of all that, the um, Referee ruled in favor of the Bigland brothers. Uh, they, they had won in spite of the, uh, the protest. Um, and that didn't sit very well with people in Poughkeepsie because the, the, uh, the young 
Young Strangers were the, the local favorites. One of the, uh, the rowers in the Young Strangers boat actually got into a fight with somebody who accused him of throwing the race. Um, he knocked the guy down, he hit his head and, and broke his neck and, and died. So uh, there was a lot of violence associated with the, uh, the racing back then. Single sculling, uh, so singles races was also uh, equally popular. Uh, there were a number of, of um, rowing stars from the area again. John Hankin uh, was from Newburgh. Uh, he was a single champion scholar in the U.S. Um, 1858. Uh, Josh Ward uh, defeated Hankin and, and was uh, said to be undefeated for four years from 1858 to um, 1862. Uh, he grew up in Cornwall. And Walter Brown, also of Newburgh, uh, became uh, American champion in, in 1866 uh, when he beat uh, Josh Ward. This is a picture of a um, training boat that the Ward brothers used on the Hudson. Um, it's in the uh, Hudson River Maritime Museum up in Kingston. It's owned by John Mylod, who's the, the former director of the, of the um, Hudson Sloop Clearwater. And you can see, it's hard, not a great picture, but you can see the, the hull flares out uh, so that the uh, oarsmen can have long oars and get more leverage. The, the oar locks were on the gunnels here. Um, and there was a, a sliding seat in the center of the boat so they could get a, a long stroke. Um, so much different than uh, boats that we use uh, today, which you'll, you'll see in pictures later on. In uh, Newburgh, there was uh, also a, another famous race in 1867. Walter Brown, who I mentioned earlier, and James Hamill, who was another famous uh, singles racer, uh, raced for the American Singles Championship. In this case, the purse was $4,000, which was uh, is probably about $58,000 today. So again, a lot of money riding on these races. You can see in the background, this is a, a print Courier and Ives uh, commemorating the event. You can see uh, boats in the background. There's six-man boats here. Each one of the uh, scholars had a, had a team rowing along so beside them on the race that were cheering them on, supporting them. Uh, but these guys also had pistols in their boat, and they were threatening each other. Uh, so, again, a threat of violence during the race. Um, in this case, again, it's a stake race, so they would start, um, row up around a state boat, two and a half miles, and then back to the start. So a five mile race in, in total. Uh, but in this case, as they were racing around the, uh, the state boat, the current uh, pushed Hamill up against the state boat and he got stuck there. And then Brown rammed into him and caused Hamill to flip over into the water. So again, big controversy in the race with, with a lot of money on the line. Uh, Hamill, um, after the referees reviewed it, Hamill was declared the, the winner um, because they said uh, Brown caused him to uh, uh, fall into the water. Uh, but again, huge crowds, the, it was reported that the uh, huge crowds in the dock during the protest, they got so excited they, they broke the dock and everybody fell in the water. So it was uh, quite a scene. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, at the beginning that uh, rowing started with both professionals and amateurs. Um, and that is something that's um, uh, continued as a, as a discussion and controversy even to today. The, uh, early on, there was no distinction between professionals and amateurs. But uh, as it became a more popular sport, uh, both in England and in the United States, there were efforts made to separate uh, professionals from amateurs and professionals were considered um, working class people that worked on the docks or um, uh, in, on, the, on the boats. And so they were doing manual labor and they had, were considered to have a, a physical advantage. Whereas gentlemen who uh, uh, didn't do that kind of labor uh, didn't want to have to row against uh, somebody with that kind of uh, training. So there was a Rowing Association of American Colleges that was formed in, in 1870. Um, they put in rules that only undergraduate students could compete. 
Um, and this was uh, really the foundation of NCAA rules today for eligibility for undergraduates. Um, they didn't allow professional coaches, uh, which is something they got from the British. Um, and it was pretty short lived. It, by 1876, Harvard and Yale were part of this and they, they dropped out. Uh, they wanted to set their own rules. Um, so after that, it, it pretty quickly disbanded. But about the same time, the National Association of Amateur Oarsmen was founded. And um, this was um, for any, uh, any oarsman that, that wanted to row as an amateur. Um, and it, it arose because of the increased leisure time that was available to people. Cities were growing. Um, and so the sport was getting more and more popular. Um, so again, it would separate out the gentlemen from the laborers and, and possibly uh, avoided some of the violence associated with betting. And this organization continued for quite a long time. In 1929, college, jo college rowers joined the National Association of Amateur Oarsmen. And uh, when I started rowing in, in college in the uh, 1970s, that organization was still in existence. So I was a member of that organization. Um, it was subsequently replaced by U.S. Rowing, which now manages, um, sets the rules for rowing in the U.S. as well as uh, with the uh, U.S. Olympic uh, Committee, worked with them. Uh, but professional versus amateur um, in sports is, is hotly debated today. We all, I'm sure, have read about the uh, NCAA and, and uh, the college students that, that want to get uh, paid for their uh, endorsements and take uh, advantage of their popularity. Um, and even with the Olympics, Olympics started out as, as entirely amateur. Uh, but in the 1880s, they started to allow, or 1980s, they started to allow uh, uh, professionals to uh, participate. And now it's, uh, today, it's, it's up to each individual sport to make that uh, call and set the rules. Collegiate rowing began in the U.S. Um, 1843. Uh, Yale formed the first club. Um, first competition was held in 1852 for intercollegiate sport. And uh, there was a fame, very famous race in 1869 between Harvard and uh, Oxford in England. <clears throat> um, and this was uh, featured in the New York Times. There was coverage on the, on the front page. This is a, a painting done of the, the race. Um, and uh, again, extremely popular in the, at this time, the, by the 1870s, Berlin had become very, very popular, so a lot of interest. Um, College racing at back back then would attract uh, tens of thousands of, of people. So um, at the college level, it was was very popular. 1895 is when Cornell, Columbia, and University of Pennsylvania organized their first four mile race in Poughkeepsie, and this was the beginning of the Intercollegiate Rowing Association, uh, which is still um, exists today and, and manages uh, uh, races for the colleges. So let me talk about the, the Poughkeepsie Regatta. Uh, it ran for um, over 50 years from 1895 to 1949 in Poughkeepsie. Uh, these are just examples of the program, one of the programs printed up each year for the race. And the postcard, uh, you can see the, the railway bridge, which is now the walkway in the background. And you can see these large uh, boats. These were all spectator boats that would come up uh, the river for the race and anchor along the, the course and, and people would uh, watch the race from, from their boats. Um, first race was 1895. It continued annually. Uh, by 1921, it had become the uh, essentially the national championship for colleges. Um, every, every few years, more colleges would join. Um, here's a, a list here. So by 1921, we had colleges from the Midwest, the East Coast, obviously the Midwest, and the West Coast. Uh, so that was, was why it was considered a national championship. Uh, it lasted um, all the way to 1949. There were gaps for World War I and World War II, and it was probably ultimately World War II, which ended up uh, uh, contributing to the, the racing ending in 1949. Um, in 1950, 
Uh, the racing went to Marietta, Ohio, um, only lasted two years there, and then went to Syracuse, New York, and eventually to Camden, New Jersey. And the race uh, races shortened in length from originally four miles in uh, 18, um, and when it left Poughkeepsie, it went to Marietta, they, they reduced it to three miles. And then in eight, 1968, they went down to 2,000 meters, which is the, the current race distance today. This is, a, a, again, a photograph of the race. Um, this is in 1923. And you can see the crowd along the shore. This is a rainy day, obviously, a lot of umbrellas, but you can see the shore is packed. You can see the, the river itself is, is um, filled with, with pleasure boats, relatively small boats on, on this shore. And you can see on the far shore, there's a large ferry, some very large excursion boats. Um, you can see the boats racing, these, these long, small lines here. These are the actual eights racing down the course. Um, and there were uh, uh, Navy ships would come up and anchor as well uh, to watch the races. Of course, Navy was uh, a participant in the race. So why did the, the racing come to Poughkeepsie? Why was Poughkeepsie? There were, there were a number of reasons which made it uh, an ideal venue. Uh, first and foremost, it had a straight four mile course. Um, so there are not many rivers where you can get that kind of uh, uh, length. It was also wide, so they could get 13 boats uh, across uh, for a, a, um, a large race. Uh, it was deep enough so that all those spectator boats you saw could come up the river and, and uh, anchor and, and watch the race. The railroad bridge, now the walkway, paid a, played a big part. It provided transportation east and west, so people could come from Pennsylvania, they could come from Hartford and Boston to watch the race. And of course, the, the railroad up and down the, the river brought people from Albany and New York City. Um, there's also, uh, because there were tracks on both sides of the, of the river, there's an observation train that was set up on the Highland side would follow the race. Um, and the um, business community provided uh, housing and uh, uh, storage for boats on the river. So that was uh, also a big piece of it. So it was a very um, popular for uh, uh, civically for Poughkeepsie um, and that attra was attractive for the uh, IRA committee. This is a, a picture of the um, spectator train. So it was a flatbed train and they um, built bleachers on top of the train. Uh, they had a canopy over the top in case it rained. And this train, so it's a four mile race, it would follow the race all the way down the course. Um, and you can see it's quite long. So they, would, they had many, many uh, seats available. They would sell tickets. People would buy tickets down in New York City. They could take an excursion train up to Poughkeepsie, um, get off, go across the river, uh, across the uh, railroad tracks to uh, the Highland side and, and uh, get on this observation train. Um, by 1932, there were reported to be 50,000 spectators um, watching on the two sides of the, uh, of the river. So you can imagine that for the civics leaders, this was a huge event. This is a this is like a, a Super Bowl event here in Poughkeepsie and over in Highland uh, annually for uh, over 50 years. So um, quite important to the local economy. Another picture of 1926 uh, Navy crew launching. This is at Kale Rock. You can recognize that in the background. There's a boathouse on the shore here with with. Uh, docks. Um, so this is one of the places that the crews would stay and launch their boats for the races. This is a uh, picture of the railway. I'm sure you all recognize it. It's now the walkway. Um, it was a very uh, instrumental um, piece of the, uh, of the racing on the river. Uh, as I mentioned before, it provided transportation for spectators to get to Poughkeepsie. Um, it served as an observation platform. They would have men stationed on the, along the tracks here, and they would shut down the train service during the races, and uh, they'd have somebody stationed over each lane, and you can see the, the boats racing here. So they were spread out um, 
all along under the, the bridge. The coxswains could steer by the um, structure of the railroad bridge. These X's would serve as, as lane markers. Would have men stationed up here, and as the boats came under the bridge, they would send off explosives indicating as it came through under their their lanes, so people on the shore could get some sense of who was who was ahead during the uh, during the race. And then when the boats crossed the finish line, they would uh, unfold the colors of the winning crew, so everybody knew the who the winners were. This is a uh, picture of the trophy. Um, these were quite large. They were roughly two feet tall. So if you think of uh, trophies for um, events like Wimbledon, um, uh, the America's Cup, large silver cups, these are of that magnitude. Um, so they were quite, quite fancy, quite expensive uh, uh, trophies. This was the, uh, the varsity. Uh, trophy, the freshman trophy, and this was for a four-oared race, a, a big cup for that. Uh, these trophies were on display at, at Mystic Seaport. The, uh, there was a rowing museum that uh, was open for about uh, six or seven years in Mystic. Um, unfortunately, it's closed now, but when it was open, it was on display. These uh, trophies are, are still um, stored at Mystic, so hopefully at some point, uh, Space will be found to reopen that uh, that museum so people can see them again. This is a picture of Regatta Row in, in Poughkeepsie. So this is what it looked like uh, when the crews were down here racing. There's a, a boathouse for Cornell, for California, which is uh, Berkeley. Uh, this one's Washington. This was originally built as an MIT boathouse, and then Washington took it over when they started racing here. Um, and there was a mess all over on the right that you can just see the corner of here. So the crews would live on the top floor. Uh, they'd stay here for about two weeks before the racing, um, building up, practicing before actual races. And then their boats would be stored on the ground floor. Uh, today, this is now, um, it was original city, originally city property, but that was uh, um, transferred to Marist College. So this is now uh, on the Marist campus. And today, this, this is what the uh, Cornell Boathouse looks like. The other boathouses, uh, one was California Boathouse was torn down and the Washington Boathouse burned down in the 1950s. Uh, so the only one remaining is the Cornell Boathouse, but it's still used by Marist College for uh, um, events uh, today. Further north along the shore, in what is now, today is Quiet Cove, uh, was a Navy boathouse. So they had a, a separate uh, bunkhouse and uh, mess hall, and then a, a full boathouse <clears throat> at Quiet Cove. And today, if you look from the river, this is what it looks like. The, the mess hall is, is, and bunkhouse is still there, um, still standing. The boathouse is no longer there. Um, recently, uh, decking has been put up at Quiet Cove, if you've been down there, out over the river. But this is right where the, uh, the original boathouse stood. At the, this uh, location also, um, in addition to Navy, Wisconsin, um, and I think uh, uh, perhaps one other crew had, uh, had boathouses as well. Um, and across the river, there was a, a Columbia, across from Pike Cove, there was a Columbia boathouse. So why did the regatta leave Poughkeepsie? Um, which was unfortunate for, for uh, the uh, Poughkeepsie economy. But the, um, after World War II, the observation train was no longer available. It had been commandeered for transporting war goods um, and so was no longer available to set up for the, uh, the bleachers. Uh, the boathouses uh, had been falling into disrepair and the city was reluctant to invest more money into fixing them up. Um, in addition, the, the river was, is tidal, there could be very strong currents, and it, it could get rough, and they had to postpone racing uh, sometimes uh, for a day or two. So uh, Marietta, Ohio was, was um, anxious to attract the IRA committee, so they, uh, the Ohio River did not have tides, and they had the uh, university with um, dormitory housing very close by. 
Um, and they also offered some money to bring the IRA, so they, the IRA left the KFC at that point, went to Marietta. Um, unfortunately for Marietta, they had flooding for two successive years, so the IRA left uh, Marietta and went to Syracuse and then finally came to where it is today. And that leads us to um, rowing in the high schools in, in uh, Poughkeepsie. When the IRA left Poughkeepsie, the local uh, Chamber of Commerce, Junior Chamber of Commerce, uh, Italian Center, so local businessmen said, maybe there's a chance we could get rowing to come, the IRA to come back. Let's not uh, just give up on rowing here. Let's use the equipment, keep the boathouses active, uh, make it available to the local high schools. So that's what they did. Um, of the local high schools, Roosevelt, Arlington, and Poughkeepsie took them up on that uh, uh, offer. And so the Mid-Hudson uh, Schoolboy Rowing Association, which today is, is known as Mid-Hudson Rowing Association, um, uh, acquired the equipment from the, the colleges and uh, set up the docks and provided coaches so uh, they could run the, the programs for the, the high schools. Um, they also sponsored races in Poughkeepsie. Uh, they had a, a local championship called the Triangular Race for the three schools, uh, which is still held today. And although there are more schools, but it's still called the Triangular Race. And then the Mid-Hudson Invitational Regatta, uh, which they run every year in the, in the spring, uh, which grew to have uh, up to 20 schools from around the, uh, the Northeast. Um, and that ran until uh, uh, early 2000s and was ended up being replaced by uh, New York Scholastic Championships, which are up in Saratoga Springs now, uh, which again is a, is a more protected body of water. So it's more reliable for, for holding races than in the Hudson River. Um, the National Scholastic Championships were also held in Poughkeepsie in 1954 and 1964. So that rowing, um, in spite of the colleges uh, leaving, is, is, is continued. Um, in the 1960s, the high schools began running their own programs. Um, that's when the, uh, shortly after the Washington Boathouse burned down um, in 1957. So with that, I will uh, just wrap up by saying there is um, if you find this fascinating, there are a couple of books I'd highly recommend. Boys in the Boat um, is a great story, even if you're not uh, into rowing. It's, it's a great sports story, but it also talks a lot about the racing in Poughkeepsie. Um, and Ready All, George Roman, Yeoman Pocock and Crew Racing. Uh, George Pocock was a famous boat builder from Washington, and he built many of the boats that were raced in Poughkeepsie and would ship them by ship or train to Poughkeepsie for racing. Um, and uh, I want to shout out for the Maris Digital Archives um, created by Elizabeth Clark and Ann Sandry. Um, this is their website and they've got an excellent um, <clears throat> digital archive, uh, a lot of details from the, the IRA and racing in Poughkeepsie. Um, and some of the pictures from this presentation came from those archives. And with that, I'll turn it over to Josh. Thanks, Bill. Um, before I begin, we had one question, uh, and I do not know the answer to this. While the, 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 tra the observation train was running on the west coast of the Hudson River, Bill, uh, did that interfere with the, the freight train's normal schedule? Did CSX exist during that time? or? Oh, you're on mute, Bill. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So, yeah, the, the tracks obviously were there for uh, freight and, and passengers. Uh, they weren't there exclusively for the IRAs. So, um, this was such a big event that they would... Um, you know, work the train um, commercial traffic schedule around the event. Uh, so it was, you know, scheduled usually in the uh, afternoons and, and early evenings of uh, the, it's usually over like a two day period. And so they would just uh, halt the train traffic through uh, 
both up and down the, the shore as well as across the, uh, the walkway um, okay. at that time. Right, okay. Good, so um, good evening, everyone. 1998, uh, a, a rowing association, you, you'll see here, with this is a rendering of the boathouse. This isn't an actual photo, it's just an architectural rendering. Uh, I was one of the many oars people who were a benefit to the Mid-Hudson rowing work that went on um, in organizing and putting on races for the scholastic teams in the, in the area. Uh, up until the 90s, it was just three schools. It was Poughkeepsie, Arlington, and Roosevelt that um, the, the colleges left some oars and they left some shells for those local high schools to get started at the request of the chamber um, and the different community organizations like the Italian Center. So those three schools were supported in part by the Mid-Hudson School Boys Rowing Association, now Mid-Hudson. Um, I still remember in the 90s when they would set the stake boats out for our races that started up by Quiet Cove. We would do a 1500 meter race uh, for high school rowing, um, colleges and Olympic level uh, rowing and, and different different worlds events are all 2,000 meters. Uh, to give you some perspective about that, that's about a mile and a quarter. Um, so 1,600 meters is a mile uh, to give you some perspective there. So um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, all these different schools were going to lose their housing. Um, uh, you know, and that's part of uh, what what you know, made this boathouse come to fruition. So Hudson River Rowing Association was founded in 1998. Uh, Lords was around. Lords had a rowing program by that point. Uh, they were all rowing out of Quiet Cove. Um, Arlington and Poughkeepsie were actually still rowing out of the Cornell Boathouse that is sitting on the Marist campus now. Uh, they split that boathouse down the middle, but the the colony uh, the um the, the 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 psychiatric center wanted to take back their state site at Quiet Cove where Roosevelt and Lords and Mid Hudson and Hudson River Rowing Association were all launching their boats out of, and then also uh, Marist College wanted to take back their Cornell rowing uh, Cornell boathouse, restore it to its original historic grandeur, and use it for their own rowing team and uh, and different events. So these high schools were all basically losing their, their boat houses, their housing. And um, in, in 2006, Hudson River Rowing Association had been around for a while. Um, they, they were founded in 1998 and sort of um, started to begin to maybe, maybe take the reins or take control of, of uh, promoting and, and managing, dealing with the high school and scholastic rowing. So this community boat house was dedicated in 2006. It was funded in part by county money, state money, um, the Dyson Foundation and various foundations throughout Dutchess County helped uh, to pay for the boathouse. Um, there were also a number of, uh, you know, uh, individual donors. It was very important that they uh, had some individual donors for the boathouse project. Um, some notable people that got that project uh, off and running and, and passed, um, you know, were from the boathouse community, from the rowing community. So you had Andy Maurer and uh, Eric Haight from from Lords and HRA. You had Bill Austin, who was uh, a coach at Marist College in the seventies, and um, and now you know he owns the Gold's Gyms around here. Um, so these these individuals, I'm leaving out people, but these individuals were very integral in putting this boathouse together. And now it houses seven high schools and two rowing clubs. So Billy can go to the next slide and that'll show that. So uh, the, the team colors, you wear a uniform, uh, but the team colors are depicted on, on the rowing blades. Um, you'll see here, these are, these are all called hatchet blades for these high schools on the left and the adult programs on the right. Um, you have the original Poughkeepsie, Arlington, Roosevelt three, but then later on Spack and Kill, Lords, Wappingers, uh, the two different rap Wappingers schools actually formed a club for Wappingers, um, for John Jay and Ketchum, and then you have Rhinebeck as well. We do have uh, athletes rowing from different uh, local 
high schools and different school districts that do not have a rowing team. And they typically just row for Hudson River Rowing Association in the spring, the summer, and the fall. Um, and then you've, of course, you have Mid-Hudson Rowing Association and Hudson River Rowing Association on the right there. So we can go next slide, Bill. Um, and this is this is basically the same shot, but or the same the same programs, but it's a shot of uh, the oars that we have hung on our tank room. It's an indoor rowing tank room where you can actually have eight rowers or eight scullers row in in tanks with actual physical water. These oars are twelve feet long, and they only weigh about ten pounds each. They're made out of carbon fiber. Uh, these oars are actually a little bit older. They still make wooden oar handles, uh, but that wooden spot that you see off at the end, the opposite end of the blade is, is your oar handle, and that's made out of wood there. Uh, but now they use carbon fiber and different composite materials for the, for the newer blades. Um, so you can flip again, Bill. Uh, these are all the schools that row up and down the, the Hudson River uh, in, in the, the Hudson Valley. So you've got um, the schools that are housed in our boathouse at the community boathouse in Poughkeepsie, but then Kingston and Newburgh Free Academy, boys and girls. Uh, you've got uh, um, a, a couple farther south um, that come up and race in Poughkeepsie. And then you have the colleges, West Point, Vassar, which was founded in 1983 and Marist in 66, and then SUNY Albany Union and RPI. And we can flip to the next slide, Bill. So this shows you a very wide breadth of what types of colleges have rowing. Um, a few years ago, we felt that it was uh, important. One of our board members, Sue Cerulli, who is, is uh, she works in the schools in High Park and, and she's the mom of a couple alumni from Roosevelt High School. She, uh, she felt that it was important to signify for the for the students who are in school locally hey you can row in college and maybe you don't go to a Yale or a Harvard or an Ivy League school but you're going to a smaller school a state college uh, maybe you're going to school across the country or someplace in the south and uh, I would venture to say there's I, I don't know how many rowing schools there are in the country um, there's well over a hundred maybe even close to 200 if you talk about all the clubs um, but this is just a small snapshot. These are actually schools that our rowers went to, our rowers who um, attended any one of those local seven high schools have gone to and competed at, whether they're a rower or a coxswain. The coxswain is the smaller person that steers the boat and coaches the rowers on the water. Um, and this is hanging in our tank room as well. We can go to the next slide, Bill. Um, and uh, maybe I'll go back to that. We, we set up a list. We, we have a historical list in the boathouse at the community uh, boathouse that actually shows every rower, every coxswain that we can track back to, you know, the, the, the history that we have. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see how many kids rode locally and then went on to row in college as well. Um, in any given year, there's about 300 uh, junior rowers at all those seven high schools. And so in the spring, it's very busy down at the boathouse um, with, with the practice times after school. So we, we can flip back to that again, sorry, Bill. Um, okay, this is a single skull. So boats come in various sizes. Most high school athletes row in eights or fours, uh, but this is a single. And a single is, is a great boat to be able to row because if you don't have a teammate or if you have an odd number of people, you show up for a club practice and uh, you have five individuals who can row and you have a coxswain, well, you can send out a four with a coxswain, you can send out a single. Um, the issue with a single is that it's very tippy. It's, it's barely wider than your body. Uh, this is the cockpit of the single. You can see the shoes in there and uh, a little computer monitor, a little LCD readout in between the shoes. Um, it uses GPS nowadays. It used to use an impeller, impeller that was underneath the boat and had a magnet to communicate what speed the boat was going. Um, you've got the seat there and you've got the oars. You can see the blue handle there. That's for your left hand or your starboard oar. The port oar, if, if someone would be, get, would be you know, uh, ready to launch and go out in the shell, they would push that port oar across 
the handles of these two oars match up in the middle and uh, you'd get in the boat very carefully while balancing the boat and shoving off the dock. So this is a single. The single is about a 30 pound boat. Um, a lot of rowing is in uh, millimeters. It uses the metric system. So we talk in millimeters and centimeters often and we talk in kilograms. So most singles are somewhere right around 14 kilograms or 30 pounds. And singles vary in length from 24 feet to 26 or 27 feet, depending on the size of the athlete, of course. Um, boats are manufactured for lightweight athletes, uh, super, uh, super fly or you know, flyweight athletes where the boats could be as light as uh, a person that weighs 110 or 115 pounds. Um, lightweight categories right around the 130 range. But I would say most people fit into the midweight shells. They, they fit in that 150 to 175 range. And then you've got the heavyweight that gets up to 200 pounds. And then you got your super heavy, super heavyweight, 220 and above. So this is a single and, and we can flip to the next screen, Bill. Okay, these are eights, uh, very different uh, uh, rowing vessels here. So. Um, it looks like an Arlington boat in the foreground. That's an eight. We, um, we have eight rowers and they are using one single oar each. So in the, in the past, in, in just the last photograph, we showed you a single skull with very light oars. Uh, the rower or the sculler has one oar in each hand. Well, this is sweep rowing where you have one oar and then you move out to the side, whether it's the port side or the starboard side. Um, and these two boats are, it looks like they're heading south, racing on the Hudson. Um, the water looks pretty decent, a little ripply, but we've all gone over the Hudson River where we see white caps from the bridge, and that is not rowing weather. Um, you will not see us out there in, in, in that type of environment. Every once in a while, we, we have to hurry up and get off the water because the wind blows up and, and a storm cell comes through or just it gets really choppy pretty quickly. We've got barges. Uh, the Hudson River is actually not technically a river. It's an estuary because it, the tide comes in, it moves south, and then the tide flows out, um, and, and there's, there's tides. So there's two, two tides a day, just like uh, if you were at the beach and you were in the bay. So um, it's a tidal river, and then you've got the wind. It's very open and spacious. And then you've got the, 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 the boat traffic, whether it's barges or um, pleasure boats. Up at the top, I have a bunch of crazy numerations, letters, and uh, plus signs and negative signs and X's. These are the, I just thought it was interesting. I was going to cover rowing shells. The eight plus, the four plus, the two plus, that just means those are the number of people in the crew shell rowing the boat. And then you have a coxswain. So eight plus coxswain, two, or four plus coxswain. So that's called the eight, the four, or the pair. Uh, with the four negative and the two negative, that's that's a straight four or a, or a pair. They don't have coxswains. And then there's no coxswains in sculling boats with the four, the double, and the single. I thought that would be interesting. Just some crazy nomenclature, some some uh, some shop talk for for rowers. We can go to the next next screen, Bill. Um, oars were made out of wood uh, originally uh, back in the 1800s in the early part of this century. Uh, you can see that boat that was up in the Kingston, um, uh, the Kingston Maritime Museum that John Mylod owns. It was very wide. It was wooden. Uh, it's like if you're in shop class in high school and you're making a bridge and you're gluing together all those little parts to make it strong. That's the way boats used to be built. Um, these boats that you're looking at right here are, are uh, carbon fiber boats. Uh, there might be some fiberglass or some Kevlar in these boats. Um, these aren't maybe the newest boats. These boats were probably the newest thing uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, but we were starting to use carbon fiber back, back in that time. And then you can see the oars on the left. Those are also carbon fiber oars, but we've evolved from wood, uh, wood, a combination of wood and fiberglass. We were at a period of time maybe in uh, the late 60s, early 70s, and up through the 80s and 90s, we were using uh, carbon, uh, we were using um, wooden hulls or, or wooden gunnels on the boats along with a, uh, a fiberglass skin along with the wooden structure inside. And then we've moved towards carbon fiber um, throughout the years, which is stiffer, lighter, 
Um, it's, it's, uh, I would say easier to repair. It's made in a mold. It's not handmade, a handcrafted wooden shell, uh, would be very difficult to make, very difficult to repair and also very heavy. So times have gotten faster, um, as well. We can go to the next slide, Bill. Um, on, on the top, you see one of those, um, older wooden boats with the wooden, um, structure inside and, uh, down below. You've got uh, a, a newer Pocock ration shell. So I'm not quite sure if that's a Pocock up top, but um, I thought it was neat to show a wooden shell. And then um, this shell, I took this picture of a, of a brand new Pocock shell. It was probably brand new in 2019. So um, there are no ribs in this shell. It's pressed together with two pieces. Um, it's very stiff. It's very light. Uh, also, up, up at the top, you can see that the riggers affixed to the side of the boat. We call those Euro riggers, where this boat down below has what are called um, wing riggers. And I apologize, I don't have, maybe we have a, a shot of a wing rigger later on in the presentation, but the wing rigger goes right over top of the individuals, right over top of the rower's feet. So imagine uh, an aluminum piece of metal across and then, and then the outrigger off to the right or to the left. Now those riggers have evolved from aluminum even to carbon fiber. So they make carbon fiber wing riggers for these boats as well now. It's lighter, it's stiffer. The wing rigger is actually part of the shell, the shell structure. So instead of having the structure all down inside the boat, they've got those eight ribs or you know uh, brace, braces across the top of the hull that also serve as riggers. So they've, they've taken care of uh, two points with one. When you put the riggers on the boat, it actually adds to the stiffness of, uh, of the boats that are wing riggers. So we can go, we go, we go to the next, uh, next slide. Um, and this is just a shot of, hey, you've got a beautiful boat up on the top, the better angle. That's, that's a beautiful, you know, old rowing shell, Pocock rowing shell. Uh, you used to have that, that interesting swoop at the end where, you know, you had the, the smaller, lighter wood. And then on the left, this is a custom carbon hull uh, for Syracuse University. You see that you could pretty much do whatever you want, but you can see the, the exposed carbon fiber in the shell. And, that, and that's just, um, instead of paint, you know, you see sometimes cars are like that driving around or race cars on the racetrack. You can do the same thing with a boat. So we can flip to the next slide, Bill. Uh, this is a, a Navy uh, 8 rowing. Um, and you can see uh, newer oars. There's composite handles that these guys are rowing with. They're rowing with those Euro riggers that are attached to the side of the boat. They're rowing a King boat, actually. You can see King just to the left um, below the coxswain. That's a, that's a brand of boat. That's a type of boat. So uh, eight oared shells. Uh, are right around 60 feet long, give or take a couple feet. Uh, they weigh just about 200 pounds. There are minimum weights for crew shells. Um, and you talk about 200 pound individuals, you put eight of them in a, in a shell, then you've got about 1,600 pounds of human going down the race course. Um, fours uh, are approximately 44 feet and about 110 or 115 pounds. Doubles and pairs are 34 feet and about 60 pounds, and then singles are right around the 26 foot and, uh, and 30 pound mark. We can go to the next slide, Bill. All right, and this just shows a, a, a few different examples. You have in the middle picture up top, you've got two individuals standing, you know, by the guy standing in the orange top. They're rowing a double off the dock. Um, you can see in the foreground uh, a single, and the single the two singles, the one with, with the gentleman holding the boat on the dock and the one with the gentleman sitting in the boat, those are wing riggers. So you can have a wing rigger for an eight with one oar out to one side, you can have a wing rigger for a single. So that's a good example of the wing rigger. And then we are just north of the walkway and you can see um, in the background there, this, this eight is coming to the dock uh, after they're recovering to the dock after their row. And um, you can see the walkway, it's about uh, maybe 800 meters, 1,000 meters away from the dock. Um, it's fairly close. So um, 
that's how that's how right where we row out of in Poughkeepsie. So you can go to the next slide, Bill. Thank you. Um, I don't think a rowing presentation in the Hudson Valley could be complete without mentioning this gentleman here, um, Scott Sanford. If if there was a grandfather to uh, to the sport in my mind, I'm sure there's other people, there's other men and women who have been very in influential in in the rowing world, but. Um, Scott was a teacher, literally. Um, he, he taught in Buffalo, he taught in Hyde Park, and then he was a, uh, a principal at Spackenkill. But he was a teacher and a mentor, and he just loved the sport so much. Um, he went to Syracuse University where he learned how to row with his brother Bill. Um, he taught um, in Buffalo for a time, and he coached um, at Buffalo. He coached the sport of rowing. I've met some of his former athletes. Uh, and I, a couple of them have gone to Syracuse University, um, and I've, I've met them, and they asked me where I'm from, and I let them know I'm from Poughkeepsie and Hudson Valley, and they, we get talking, and, and they know Scott very well. Um, and then he coached at, at Roosevelt for a time. He coached at Roosevelt High School for a number of years uh, where he taught as well, um, and that's where I went to high school, and I was recruited by his wife, Judy Sanford. So um, I got real in. Uh, by his sidekick, uh, who, who used to do all the recruiting in the schools for FDR. Um, Scott moved on from FDR, and while he was the principal of Spackenkill High School, he founded the Vassar Rowing Program. So in 1983, in the fall of 83, he, he founded the program. He, he uh, had a vision for Vassar and went to the, uh, the powers that be at Vassar College and, and let them know that there's this great opportunity for a sport fitting to a school like Vassar College. And they just needed to, you know, pick up some some secondhand boats and and uh, have a facility at the river. So um, Vassar College ended up buying some property from Dutton Lumber, and uh, and they own Vassar College still owns the property uh, south of Marist College and north of One Duchess, the new condos that are being built on the old Duchess uh, on the old, old Dutton Lumber Yard. Um, so he was at Vassar College from 1983 to 1993. Um, I do know Ed Clark's on the phone call now. He's on the, the Zoom call. And Ed Clark was a, uh, a good friend of Scott. He rode for Scott at FDR. He coached with him at Vassar. He coached with him at, at Marist. And he's uh, one of my good rowing friends. And um, I, I know Ed's, Ed's out there. So, so hi, Ed. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who learned how to row, uh, this is – rowing in general you know or coaching in general you you play basketball or you row for a certain coach and then you end up getting into the sport and 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 loving it um we can go to the next slide bill and, um, and teresa how are we doing josh, on time? Do we need to uh speed things up or i promise i'll i'll speed things up i'm almost done josh uh, judy uh is also on judy sanford's also on the call yes judy hi i i did know that so um, Judy and I were talking a little bit earlier today. She was she was sending me some really great rowing regalia, Bill, texting me pictures of all the different programs that she's got. So next next rowing presentation that you and I do, we'll we'll have some new photos. Um, cool. So Scott was at Marist College for nine years, ninety three to two thousand two. Uh, he unfortunately passed away in two thousand two. Um, but uh, the the guys at the guys at Marist called him the Rock. Um, he he was. He coached a small school in, in the Hudson Valley and uh, a shoestring budget. And on a shoestring budget, he was able to, to have numerous top 20 national ranked teams. So uh, Marist College competed at the IRA every year that I was in school. Um, they were fierce competition. I went to a school that had a, a lot of scholarship money available for, for recruits, and Marist did not have any available. So that's just a... Uh, a testament to these guys. This is one of the, the Marist crews down below. Um, this is the 2002 crew uh, that ended up winning uh, the Avaya Championship, which was Marist College's, um, it, it was their division uh, championship. It's like a Northeast smaller, smaller school championship. And then they went on to uh, play 16th place at the IRA National Championship, which included all the big guns, um, you know, Washington and Cal and, um, you know, Syracuse, Northeastern, Dartmouth, 
all the, all the big funded schools and, and they were able to get 16th place at that uh, regatta. Um, that regatta is held early in June and, um, and Scott was able to, to live to see um, them compete well there. Judy actually drove him to the Avaya Championship uh, and, and they all, um, they brought him down to the dock and, and they, put his, they put their medals around his, around his neck and that was a really cool, cool tribute. But um, Scott's lifelong dream was to go to the Royal, Canadian, uh, Royal Henley Regatta in England, in Henley, England. And if there was one place that rowing began, it was in England, you know, it, they can trace the roots back to the 1600s where they rode. Um, so that was wonderful. They, they ended up winning three races there and they lost to the eventual, they lost uh, to Harvard who won the regatta. And, um, it, you know, that, that was in the championship race over there. It's, it's dual match racing. So it's one-on-one -on -one and uh, you know, the loser goes home and, or, or gets to watch from the sidelines while, while the winners advance and go through the week. So uh, that was pretty special. And that, that took place right here on uh, the Hudson, you know, that, that crew developed on the Hudson here at Marist. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, another local hero was Patrick Manning. He was a FDR grad. Uh, he went to Northeastern University. Uh, he won the IRA national championship while at Northeastern in 88. He was on the national team for five years. Um, national team was based out of Princeton at the time. He rode for uh, at least one club, Penn AC, in in uh, in Philadelphia, where there's a there's a, a big boathouse row on on the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. Um, but he but he won the the good the, um, he got silver medal in the Goodwill Games, which was a it was a game it was a games between Russia and the United States that didn't have many years. They I think they they raced or they competed in the Goodwill Games for one or two years. Um, he got silver medal in the boat that you see him down below. And he was, he's the stroke seat. Um, we call that the stroke seat, actually the person that's all the way in the back of the boat. Um, so that's the stern. So Patrick Manning's in, in you know, closest to us. Um, that's actually a straight four. There's no coxswain to steer the boat. So the individuals in the boat are going backwards while rowing. They're, they're going, you know, 12, 15 miles an hour and, and they're going backwards and they have to steer straight. So there's buoys that line the course every 10 meters, little tiny buoys that keep a straight course. And um, that's the straight four. And then, uh, so we got the, the silver medal in the, the world championships. And then he also got the silver medal in the Olympic championships. Um, this is during the time where there was this very high caliber Australian crew. You can see them in the middle. Uh, they were called the awesome foursome. Uh, so instead of awesome foursome, it was the awesome foursome. And uh, these guys were pretty much unstoppable. And they had a reign for a couple of years where they just won everything. So they took second place to them in 91 at the, at the World Championships. And they took second place again in the Olympics in 1992. So that's Pat, Patrick Manning. And then if we flip the so slide, uh, we've got a few more standouts. Uh, like I said, uh, dozens, uh, you know, probably well over 100 uh, athletes have gone to college and road. But uh, these athletes went on to uh, bigger and better things. So you had Brett Wilkinson of FDR. He rode in the quad in the Olympics in 2004. Uh, the quad is four rowers, no cocks, and eight oars. Each rower has two oars, like uh, the picture down on the on the right there with Kyle Mabry. Uh, you had Joanna Mulvey uh, from Lords in 2012. She went to the Junior Worlds and, and won the silver medal in, uh, in the women's eight. You have Brendan Mulvey, her brother, um, who rode at Lords, and and he was on the U.S. lightweight team that went to Worlds in 2013. Um, Joanna Mulvey ended up going to uh, Notre Dame and rowing there, and Brendan Mulvey rode at Marist. And then he went on to coach in um, in Boston at various places, and he actually ran for a number of years the head of the Charles, which is the largest sporting event, I believe. Uh, in the country. It's spread out over three days, really. And to say it's the largest sporting event is sort of weird because it takes place in the city of Boston along a race course that's, you know, three three miles long. So you have a lot of spectators and a lot of rowers. It's not in one single stadium. So it's a very large event. So Brendan Mulvey ran that for a number of years. Um, Kyle Peabody was an Arlington standout. He went to the U23 Worlds 
and he spent numerous years with the U.S. national team. Um, he also competed at Pan Am Games a couple of years ago. Um, Kyle Mabry was from Wappingers Falls. Um, he, he went to the Worlds in the U23 single in 2017. So we'll uh, we'll flip this flip again. Um, so Desiree and Rhett Burns, another standout um, uh, couple of, couple of siblings. Desiree went to FDR, as did Rhett. Desiree spent three years on the junior national team, which is unbelievable. Um, the junior national team is U19. So um, it's all kids who will not turn um, 19 in the calendar year. So you can be 18 years old in June uh, and compete. But if you're going to turn 19 by the end of the year, you age out of U19. So she was on the U19 team as, as quite a youngster. So she was on the team uh, as a 16, seven, uh, 17, and 18-year-old. Then she went on to be on the U23 uh, Worlds team two years uh, in 2009 and 10. Um, she went to UVA and she won um, the IRA. IRA championships or NCAA championships, Bill? If she won the IRA, she would have been in the lightweight boat. Uh, she she might have won the yeah, NCAAs. It's, it's probably NCAA. Yeah, so she won the NCAAs in for the IRA. Yeah, and so we've been talking about the IRAs and the Poughkeepsie Regatta. Um, and it's interesting because men's rowing in college is not an NCAA sport. Uh, women's rowing is an NCAA sport. Um, so uh, the the it's sort of confusing, but it goes back to the IRA was founded in 1895 and it predated the NCAA. So when the NCAA came out to be the governing body for collegiate sports, there was no women's rowing um, and women's rowing didn't exist uh, until the sixties. Um, so when women's rowing came around, NCAA was there. So it became an NCAA sport. Um, the men, uh, are still rowing under the IRA, but the IRA is the governing body for the men, and they basically use most of the NCAA rules. Uh, there's one interesting rule that the men have that the women do not, and it would not fly with the NCAA. They do shirt betting. Um, and so shirt betting is, um, you see Rhett down here in his, uh, that's Rhett Burns down there. Let's say he's rowing at Northeastern and he loses a race to Boston. Um, it used to be back in the day where the boats would pull together and the Northeastern crew, if they just lost to Harvard, they would hand the Harvard crew their jersey off their back. So they would hand them their cotton t-shirt off their back. And so Harvard would win the shirt. And the, the shirt betting is something where uh, the men's teams throughout the country, at least the higher caliber men's teams throughout the country, the club teams don't do it because of their budget constraints, but um, at colleges like Northeastern and Marist and Syracuse and University of Washington, Cal, Yale, Harvard, you shirt bet. So every race that you race, your shirt is on the line, your physical shirt, um, which is pretty neat. The women can't do that. The NCAA won't allow that, but the, the IRA allows for it. So um, Desiree won the NCAAs, and that's a that's a phenomenal accomplishment, and that's a a local homegrown talent um, from the Hudson Valley. So we're very proud of what she accomplished. Rhett is currently at Northeastern. Um, he, uh, he's the captain of his Northeastern team this year. Uh, he, he came out of Roosevelt. He was an accomplished swimmer in Roosevelt. We didn't know if he was going to be a swimmer or a rower in college. Um, he started to get recognized by colleges. And then he went out and he won the head of the Charles in the second time down the course in 2017. Not only did he win the head of the Charles, um, but he set a course record. And, and that was pretty amazing. That course record stood for a couple of years and then it was eclipsed by another kid. So he was up against um, junior rowers from various countries. Uh, people come to the head of the Charles in Boston every year from all over the world. So you'll have kids from adults you'll have you'll have national teams from from great britain from from france from uh from ireland from new zealand and australia um it's an amazing international event along with all the colleges are there um 
various clubs are there. There's masters rowing for adults and they have age categories for the masters. Uh, every 10 years, there's a, there's a new category of racing and the age handicap on top of that. But you will literally have people in their eighties competing at the head of the Charles. Every once in a while, you'll see somebody in the nineties, but that's not typical at the head of the Charles. I would say um, it's just a great uh, competition. You'll have kids from 16 years old, people all the way up to their 80s. So Rhett Burns won the U19 uh, single uh, competition at the head of Charles in 2017. Um, and then last year, he was invited to the U U23 men's selection camp, but it was canceled due to COVID. This year, he went to the U23 uh, selection camp and he, and he was selected to the boat. He rode with a kid from Brown, a kid from Princeton, a kid from uh, Stanford, kid from Dartmouth, um, and, and he was there from Northeastern, and he made the eight that went to uh, the Czech Republic and won, single, oh, won, won silver medal. Um, it was a great race between Great Britain and Germany um, and the United States. The United States was leading for quite a bit of the race, and uh, Great Britain just clipped him right at the end, and Germany came in third place. It was a wonderful race to watch on, uh, you know, we do everything virtually these days. So let's let's flip the let's flip the slide, Bill. Um, so uh, this is where we'd like to invite you to watch rowing. We we have been hosting Mid Hudson Rowing Association and Hudson River Rowing Association has been ho we've been co-hosting um, the Poughkeepsie Regatta for three years. Um, in 2019, we had our pilot year. 2020, we had COVID. We're still dealing with COVID now in 2021, but we have some strict measures to keep people apart. And the great thing is it's outdoors. Teams can stay away from each other for the most part. Um, it's going to be October 20, uh, 2nd. It's Saturday morning. Uh, it'll run from 7.15 to 10.30. All different boat categories will be racing. Different categories as far as uh, size of boats and then age brackets of boats. So there'll be junior rowers in high school, for the scholastic kids, and then you'll have high, uh, college and master's rowers. Uh, you can view it from the walkway over the Hudson. We will go right underneath the walkway. Uh, we'll be starting up um, near the culinary. It's a three mile race. We're gonna be uh, up at the culinary. We're gonna finish at the Mid-Hudson Bridge, right past Kale Rock. So we will be racing right underneath the walkway over the Hudson, just, just like they used to do underneath the Poughkeepsie train bridge for the, for the Poughkeepsie regatta um, and, and sponsored by HRRA and Mid Hudson Rowing Association. So we'd love for you to come out. It's a festival type of an experience at a fall regatta. It's a fun thing. I mean, we won't be providing the festival this year, but um, typically there's vendors and every once in a while there's a band that shows up and plays, but um, we'll be, we'll be hosting the regatta and you're more than welcome to come check it out and see what that looks like on October 2nd. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. And um, uh, we, uh, we'd like to take some, some questions and say thank you for your time this evening. Well, thank you both. That was really involved. I didn't realize how much, um, it, you know, how much of rowing that it really does impact all of our schools. I have high schoolers now, so it, I hear a lot about it. And um, we're excited for you both to be doing that. Also, it's great timing with the October 2nd viewing. Come out at 7.15, be there till 10.30, and then run right over to Walktoberfest on the Highland side of the walkway, where there'll be food vendors and um, crafts and, and the farmer's market. So with that- Well, there's your questions? festival, Teresa. Walktoberfest. Yep. October, Walktoberfest, yes. So any questions for Bill and- um, Josh, if I can unmute the lines, I will do that. Let's see. Okay, so anybody that would like to unmute? Okay. If you have a question, I looked at the chat. I think you did mention the one we had. Uh, there was a question too about those that receive those achievements for college that you mentioned. Josh, how is it a single when it when they're rowing in a group? Right. So most of the high school competition takes place in eights and fours. Uh, but every once in a while, an athlete wants to do something on his or her own. Um, 
because they've they've got an itch they want to scratch to see how they match up and, and see how they do. You know, I'd liken it to swimming. You know, you have a relay race for swimmers, but then there's a lot of single competition to see how people do on their own. Um, Rhett was, uh, you know, he's an FDR um, athlete, and we don't typically send many scholastic teams to the head of the Charles. Uh, we might send, um, you know, one boys eight, and one girls eight in, in a year. I mean, for instance, this year, none of our junior rowers are going to be competing at the head of the Charles, but we have one standout uh, high school athlete. He's actually from a high school that does not have a rowing team. So he bought his own single skull and uh, he's been rowing. He learned how to row actually with, with the master's team uh, for a learn to row a few years ago because he was just so large. Um, he's, he's six foot six and, and he's a, he's a big fella. So he, he was a grown man basically when he came to us when he was a freshman in high school. So uh, he'll be racing in a single, um, but that's a good point. It, it's up to the coaches to guide the rowers uh, and it's up to the rowers to, to have that uh, inkling that they want to, they want, they, they want to do that. But that opportunity for rowing a single is best done in the summertime when the water's warm and uh, we row in the summertime, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning before pleasure boats are out there on the water um, and before the wind kicks up. Uh, the prevailing wind on the Hudson River, it, it's typically a west wind, so you get blocked by the, the highland side of the river. Um, and when the sun rises and starts to warm up the atmosphere, that's also when the, the, the wind starts to kick up. So rowing in the morning is, is the best time to row. Um, whether it's on the Hudson River or any place around the country, it's typically just better conditions in the morning. Um, but uh, but yeah, how do, how do kids get into a single? There's there's learn to row programs that that both Mid Hudson and Hudson River Rowing Association do every year, where they get people out in singles. Um, both clubs probably teach, uh, you know, between eight and. 20 new rowers a year how to row, whether it's rowing in an eight with sweep oars or rowing in a single or a double with two oars a piece. Thank you, Josh, that helps. Um, well, and any other questions? I just have a little show and tell. Uh, this is a glass from the regattas. Um, my father never missed a race. And he was on the um, he was on the the uh, trains. And, oh, yeah. uh, so mm -hmm. I just wish he was alive today to see how rowing is still still so active. And um, and I learned so much tonight. Um, um, thank you so much. It was really fascinating. Well, our pleasure. And thank you, Nancy, for introducing us to, uh, to Josh and Bill about the whole, you know, the membership. So that's really wonderful. Well, um, let me wrap up. up. Go ahead. Up for Peter Van Aken has his hand up, I think. Oh, great. Oh, we took it down. Oh, okay. Peter? Okay. So, I'm but, just um, thanking Nancy for her contribution. That was, that's very personal and, and makes sense uh, the mania the, the 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 excitement of rowing to produce these commemorative glasses so good stuff on nancy mid hudson has taken up that mantle nancy now they they sell mugs for fundraisers for the high schools at at the regattas oh they, really they, yeah they sell uh an, it, it's the ore so they they have the oars of the hudson valley on a mug Mm -hmm. So well, actually, it's a glass. We have a beer. Oh, it's a glass. Sorry, it's a beer glass, glass with, uh, right. with all the oars uh, all mm -hmm. the for the high schools on it. Yeah. You know, I have a son who is a former rower, as many of you know, but I keep thinking, where would this glass be best donated to? Dutchess County Historical Society? There, is there a museum? I know Marist has artifacts. I don't know. I, it's uh, hard Marist, to decide. There, there, there is a yeah, there is a Dutchess County Sports Museum. Uh, it's, it's down in Wappingers. I don't. I assume it's still down there. Mm. They, have, they have a lot of, of cool stuff. They have uh, all sports, a lot of baseball stuff. They have uh, ice boats from uh, when ice boating was popular on the river. So it's ah. quite a wide range. Of things. 
I would give it to my son, but I've kept it. It's been safe for 72 years. So I'm just afraid <laughs> if, if he dropped it or he moved or. Okay. <laughs> Well, Mar Maris would, might, might be interested because they. Yeah, they I think Maris would. For, the archives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Archives for the IRA. Uh, it's not going to be soon. I'm going to have it for a while. <laughs> well, that's great. And that's good to know about the uh, merch. So I appreciate doing that. Um, so our next, um, our next lecture, actually, presentation will be in person. Um, and so we'll have information. Please, please visit walkway.org uh, for slash events. And we also will have the regatta information listed there as well. So with that, I would just say thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. And thank you to Bill Josh Nancy for, for putting this presentation on. Thanks, thank Josh you. and Bill. Thank you, everybody. All right. Well, Bye. thank you, everyone.